Just let me, okay. I think we are recording now. Yes, we are. Okay, that's a great built-in reminder. So we are recording. <laughs> and that means uh, that if you don't want your beautiful face to live on the internet for an indeterminate amount of time, because we will be uploading this recording to Western Neighborhood Projects, um, YouTube channel, then I suggest that you keep your camera off for the duration of our chat. Um, also, if you aren't speaking, I encourage you to please keep yourself on mute so that we can cut down any kind of background noise that might be distracting. And while either presenters or audience members are speaking, um, we do encourage you to just go wild in the chat, you know, talking to each other, asking us questions, whatever feels right. We will have board member Arnold Woods in the audience. And I know David Gallagher is here with us today as well, our longtime co-founder. So folks will be able to chat with you and softball us questions from off stage. Um, and while, I hope I don't need to say this. I'm just going to go ahead and say it anyways, which is please be respectful and polite during the course of our discussion tonight. Um, everyone is here for the same reason, and that's because we love the Cliff House collection and every suggestion is valid and welcome. So we'll be here to answer your questions and talk about all aspects of the collection but we won't be able to answer questions or discuss National Park Service plans for the Cliff House restaurant or what the Hauntalis is planned to do in the future. That's not our ship. We're not sailing that boat. Um, but, uh, oh, also let's not fall down the rabbit hole of why did this happen? Uh, because that's not, there's nothing we can do about that, right? We're here now and, um, and we have a lot of history to talk about. So sometimes it's, Better if we as historians focus on the future of the past instead of the past of the past. Uh, and that's where you come in, right? All of you, uh, please don't be afraid to share your thoughts and your questions either in the chat or audibly on screen because that's what we're here to do today. So let's uh, get on to the good stuff, right? Now the housekeeping's out of the way. Um, the structure for this evening We'll include an update from the dream team. And then we're gonna share you, uh, uh, we're gonna talk about the full list of 104 artifacts that we were able to save from the auction. So please feel free to ask us questions as, as we go. And then it'll be your turn. Um, oh, we're also gonna tell you what we've been up to, what kind of plans we've been making, what kind of hands we've been shaking, all that kind of stuff. Um, and when it is your time to talk, you'll know when the slide hits the screen, when, we're, when we've hit that part of our, of our uh, evening tonight. Um, we'll be asking you to use the little button on the lower bar of your screen, that's a little raised hand, to raise your hand. And maybe folks, can you just give that a try for me right now, just to make sure that everybody uh, knows how the raise hand function works? I know we're all zo old Zoom hats. Well, yeah, I'm seeing some hands go up. Seeing some hands, not seeing as many hands. It's all right. Ooh, okay. All right. So that's the function we'll be using. Um, we when and so when you raise your hand during that portion, Arnold Woods will call your name, and then it will be your time to speak. And when it is your time to speak, we would really appreciate it if you could keep it focused and keep it brief. We want everyone to have a chance to, um, you know, speak their piece. Um, and we also don't want to be here for the next seven hours. So um, I, ha I don't technically have a cane that can like pull you off the stage, but I do have power to mute you if you go incredibly long and I will exercise that power judiciously. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah. Oh, you can also, if you're shy and you don't want to speak out loud, totally get it. Uh, you can just type your questions in the chat and either one of our team will see it or Arnold will find it or, or it'll get answered, I promise you. Okay, there's no questions. Um, oh, and you know, with, as with every WNP virtual event, worry not, there will be some sort of a shortened after party where we just casually chat with each other. Okay, now keep on moving. We're gonna um, introduce you to the dream team. Just a little reintroduction since it's been a while since we all saw each other. And we'll start with the incredible Alexandra Mitchell of ACT Art Conservation. Uh, hi, everybody. 
Um, I'm Alex Mitchell. I'm a fine art conservator. I'm the principal conservator and owner of Act Art Conservation. Um, and Nicole, do you want to do you want me to talk about why I'm how why I'm involved in this? Yeah, you got us all into this, Alex. So why don't you? <laughs> oh God. Okay. Uh, well, I came to the project. Um, I'm sure many of you know by now, but um, I came to the project because um, I'm a fourth generation San Franciscan and live out on Great Highway um, and have a deep affinity for the Cliff House, like we all do, and. I started seeing what was going on, like we all did about the Cliff House sort of falling to the pandemic and all the other things that were going on with it. And my first concern, of course, was, um, you know, I keep saying was to go like full Elaine Bennis hysterical on John Lindsay about how concerned I was about what was happening and what was going to happen with the art and what can we do. So I reached out to him and then he instantly, um, you know, was like, okay, well, I know exactly the person we need to loop into this. So we looped Nicole in instantly and it just sort of um, fell into place. And then um, from there, we uh, actually, uh, another local business um, we had seen on on her Instagram account, sort of the trajectory of this was that we had then seen on, it was, it was just a, an Instagram fiasco but we saw on um on a on a friend's Instagram account that she had actually gone in the cliff house and seen um pieces and so of course I shamelessly called her and said how did you get in there and <laughs> how can you get us in there um and so then she uh connected us with a dear friend of hers Orly Rabin, who um, was part of the family who was the auction house for the Cliff House, which then really helped us immensely in order to connect us with, with the full team. And that's sort of how we all assembled. Um, but uh, I've been practicing conservation for about 15 years here in the Bay Area and private practice on my own for a couple now. Um, and then I can speak about these guys. Um, we then looped in this amazing team, um, Andy and Deborah Rappaport, who founded and run the Minnesota Street Projects, which is an art services uh, division of a much broader mission and project that I encourage you guys all to check out um, about keeping the arts in San Francisco and making sure that artists don't get priced out of our city. Um, and they, uh, as soon as I told them what we were doing and what our mission was to keep the art and the collection and the history, um, both intact as a collection, um, and also accessible to the public. Um, the second that I casually shared with them, like, is there any way you guys could help us just move the stuff because we need the physical manpower? Um, they generously said, what do you need? Whatever you need. Um, and they easily donated over $200,000 worth of services to us at this point, honestly, um, yeah. of transport, storage, art handling, expert, expert. I mean, they custom built, if any of you guys checked out on our Instagram, um, and Julie Gear spearheaded this and, and custom built a sled for the cowboy to actually physically slide out of the cliff house. Um, and be stored in that. And um, our friends at Lawrence Fine Art, another amazing art handling company, um, without question jumped in to fabricate travel crates for the muses um, that are over 450 pounds each uh, and required a team of six in order for them to even get the thing into the crate. Um, so we're very indebted and forever grateful to our, our art service people um, I couldn't do what I do as a conservator without them. Uh, they are the, the expert service behind the entire thing. So we're very, very fortunate to have Minnesota and Lawrence on our side with, with all of this. I think it's been a incredible um, gathering of people that just without question, honestly, just jumped in and rolled their sleeves up. Um, and Act Art Conservation took this on as, as we all did, um, but in conservation world, they're called angel projects, which are uh, what conservators refer to pro bono projects. 
um, as and uh, every everybody here, just so that you guys all know too, but um, we've all, Western Neighborhoods Project, John Lindsay at um, the Great Highway Gallery, Minnesota Street Projects, Lawrence Fine Art, everybody who's been involved um, is doing this as a pro bono angel project. Um, and it's it's been very overwhelming and wonderful <laughs> to see all of San Francisco uh, rally around this in that way. And that, you know, ego and finances were not at all involved. It was like, what can we do? And jumped in and um, we're very excited that we get to create that model going forward in other circumstances, hopefully. So totally true. So Alex is the one who makes sure the babies are safe. Um, Minnesota Street Project are the ones that also make sure the babies are safe when they're on the road and then keeps them in a secure location, which we will not divulge here. I'm sorry, friends. Um, and then uh, we have John Lindsay of the Great Highway Gallery who helps us um, interpret them and brought uh, so much to this effort. John, I'm gonna let you explain your role on the team. Sure, uh, my name is John Lindsay and I've been in San Francisco about 34 years now, came here to go to cooking school, uh, took a lot of different paths, ended up working at the San Francisco Art Institute, but <laughs> I opened up the Great Highway Gallery in the Outer Sunset about 10 years ago and I've had over 70 exhibitions there and basically I'm committed to the west side of San Francisco. I'm pretty much always have been. I lived out here for a short time, but I spent quite a, a lot of time here on the beaches all around here, surfing, fishing, walking dog, uh, just hanging out with all my friends and all the people who I've, I've met all along the way. Um, so it's a big part of my personal history and my personal culture here in San Francisco. Um, so Alex was, and I were, texting back and forth, uh, messaging back and forth and thought that this was a travesty. Uh, and and we, we tried desperately to figure out, you know, what could we do about it? So that's how I, I initially got involved as she mentioned. And then beyond making the connection with, with Nicole, uh, I helped, I built the website. Um, I helped with some of the messaging and things like that. And now I'm, I'm going into a role of, of helping to visualize, you know, when we do have exhibitions and things like that, helping to curate and, and helping to lay out and make sure that things are visually appealing to everybody. Um, but I'm just, uh, I'm just so proud of all of us and all of our community who's kind of come by and rallied around this. And I'm just really excited for the future of this collection. <laughs> Me too because Western Neighborhoods Project owns it now. And because I, in the process of this all, um, <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I deeply love all of our partners on this. And um, we have cried a lot together, probably more than I have with some of my family. So, um, but who the heck is Western Neighborhoods Project? I think a lot of you know who we are, but I'm gonna give everybody the elevator pitch anyways, because this is gonna live on the internet. So, Western Neighborhoods Project is a 501c3 nonprofit that has been around since 1999, uh, preserving, interpreting, and sharing the history and culture of San Francisco's West Side. And we do that primarily uh, from a platform called outsidelands.org, where you can find all the things that we're into, all the events, the podcasts, we've got articles, tons of photos. Um, and if you actually want to hear more about the Save the Cliff House collection effort, we do have a podcast about that. So go to our website and check that out. And in 2014, we launched an auxiliary program called Open SF History to host a massive donation of historical images, thousands of images that span all of the San Francisco from like the 1850s to the 1990s that were beyond our Western neighborhood scope. So you can find that at opensfhistory.org and you're looking at um, 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 a screenshot that shows the mapping function that we included, that David Gallagher included when building out this website. And we now have over 53,000 images that are mapped and keyworded all by a small army of volunteers. So most of the photos, actually all the photos you're going to see tonight, unless someone sent them to me, are from OpenSF History. And I encourage you to check that out or click on the button and donate or become a member. Okay, now that I've done that, <laughs> we can get into what you're all here for, right? <laughs> You want to hear about the Cliff House collection that we will we were able to acquire with all of your assistance, and um, so I finally actually did the math. Not the strong suit of historians, but um, we had we did say we did save hundred and four individual artifacts from auction in March. 
um, a, a whole range of things, right? We have things from a teeny tiny tin type from the Billington Portrait Gallery that was once um, up there on the cliff, all the way to our good friend, the uh, carved bear of um, mysterious unknown provenance that people have lots of opinions about, but no one is quite sure where he's from. I promise you, even though I want to, I have not sat on the bear yet, although I think a lot of people have over the years. Um, and we are now in the process of figuring out what to do with these items, which is why you're here. But before we get into some deep dive on some um, pieces that we were able to save, I thought all of us in the team could talk about our favorite artifacts because we have grown very emotionally attached to these little babies um, <laughs> since this whole process began. Alex, maybe because I know one of them is on screen, you could talk about your little bell. Oh yes, my little guy or gal. Um, yes, the, uh, the Edwardian carousel horse is by far my favorite little, um, part of the collection. Uh, and I, I think I, I know I've said this before, but, um, I'm fourth generation San Franciscan and my, uh, grandfather, uh, who passed away, a, a year ago, Monday, actually, um, he was 103, a true city boy. Um, and he and his brothers used to play and romp around uh, at shoots, which was the earlier iteration of Playland. And he had some of his happiest memories were with his, his dad, uh, and his five brothers that, um, you know, all, all played there. And, and the thought of him getting to, uh, ha or having rid the, this, even this particular carousel horse um, has been very close to my heart. And I think uh, a lot of this project was a, um, definitely wrapped up in his memory for me. So um, I think that this, she's just a, a, a little friend of mine now that I get to think about and, and all generations of San Franciscans. So I think she's a, a really good starting point of what the collection starts to mean to people as we move through time. So she's definitely yeah. my favorite. <laughs> Absolutely, Alex. And John, um, what's your favorite that we were able to save? Oh, the totem pole, for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I just driving around, I, I used to drop my kids off. There was a little daycare in the VA hospital. And every day I would, after I would drop my son off, I would drive down the hill to go check the surf. And the, the totem pole was always my good luck beacon charm watcher safe thing that I would come around and see and then look out over the expanse of the beach so um, it's 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 just a big I iconic um, piece for me as well and I keep I keep moving around it's I keep saying it's like trying to pick your favorite kid right um, but um, we all know who your favorite is <laughs> we'll talk about that later <laughs> Yes, there's a Teddy Roosevelt menu from when he came through town, um, which we'll show you in a little bit that I love. But one of the pieces that's take on, taken on some, um, some, some greater importance since we started our campaign is we were able to save a section of the lockers, the original lockers that were in the um, in Sutro Baths. Um, we're not sure what date John Martini's working on it, don't worry. Um, but um, we, it's deeply historic. It was owned by one of the longtime employees at the Cliff House. So we were able to um, financially support that individual by purchasing these items. And then on top of it, uh, we had a longtime member who passed away, um, who, uh, who worked at the baths. And um, we'll be, we're, we're very excited that um, we get to continue telling his story by telling the story of of the lockers that um, we were able to save as well. So stay tuned for a little plaque in his honor um, at some point when these puppies find a permanent display home. So, um, and I know people have been asking for the full list. We don't have time to get into every single one here today, but, um, but we've finally done a comprehensive inventory of all the pieces we were able to save and it will be going up on our website, savethecliffhousecollection.com very soon. So, um, so stay tuned for that. It's coming um, in the next week or so, pending John Lindsay's availability to make that happen. I got time. We're all running businesses on the side <laughs> of this whole thing, so we're just a little bit. 
<laughs> so like, there's a lag time, but I promise we're, we're on it. <laughs> we're on the case. And what's incredible is 104 is quickly growing. So one of the two of the major, major pieces we were able to save are our beautiful porcelain muses, also of uh, unknown origin. We're working on it, trying to figure out. Um, and these pieces, Alex had mentioned this earlier, you have no idea what it took to get these ladies out of the cliff house. <laughs> they had to have custom crates built for them. Um, it was quite a to-do, lots of onlookers from, um, in the, from the auction <laughs> company to do it. Um, and those crates will live with them forever, which is amazing. So thank you again to Minnesota Street Project. Um, that was Lawrence Fine Arts. Thank you again to Lawrence Fine Arts. Thank you um, for doing that. And um, there, uh, so a lot of the work that we're doing right now is trying to separate lore from fact, right? And so there have been a lot of uh, stories swirling around these ladies. Um, John Martini is also working on that. Uh, we do know that there's another muse in the National Park Services collection. We're hoping one day to exhibit them all together, but we'll see. But incredibly, more pieces are coming our way since, um, since we got so much publicity, gratefully, around our effort to save items from auction. And I'm excited to say that one of the pieces that um, is coming our way is another muse. Yes. So <laughs> this is an incredible story. And, and this, is, this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so devoted to local history. Uh, we were contacted by a man who purchased two muses at a salvage yard in Berkeley in the 1970s. And um, up on the left-hand corner, you'll see an inset of one of those muses at the salvage yard. And when we did another program about the Cliff House collection, John Martini showed me a very similar photo to this that is in the public library's collection and has always been identified as in Sutro Baz women's restroom. But um, it's the same photo you're looking at here just from a different angle. Mm -hmm. And this is pieces for sale, different sinks and things for sale at this auction yard. So this individual purchased the two muses, fixed one up, sold it to a private collector. She still lives in Marin in a private collection and we're hoping to make contact with that person for potential exhibition future. Mm -hmm. And the other one fell over in the 1989 earthquake. And um, she's a little rough. You see her there in the center, she's in pieces. But as far as I know, all the pieces remain. And Alex is going to be hard at work putting her back together. Well, we ha yes, I don't personally <laughs> work on uh, porcelain pieces, but um, this is a great opportunity to say that I am um, among other guilds, uh, I, I am I am a member of the Bay Area Art Conservation Guild, which is an incredible resource if anybody ever needs an art conservator um, that's local, um, the BAACG. Uh, we have a, a member here tonight, Meg Geis Mooney, who is uh, a fantastic textile conservator um, who I'm hoping to work with on the swimsuits, um, <laughs> which we'll get to, but another another member of ours who's a, a stained glass conservator and works on porcelain and mosaics will be also taking this on as an angel project. Um, so we will get her displayed again. And then there's two more in a private collection. So I think that makes seven, Nicole, right? That we have that we have accounted for. I think I can't remember. I'm you not good at math. In a, in a Whitney collection. So that oh, makes right. seven. Right. Yeah. Yes, and yeah. So this is this is really cool. This is a, this is very cool. We only thought four existed before that. <laughs> and we're thinking, I guess, according to Greek mythology, I thank you to someone, one of our members, who pointed this out to me. There should be nine, right? Theoretically, nine should have existed at one point. Who knows where the muses will lead? Um, and by the way, the you'll see them on the far left. That's them in situ in the Sutro Baths rumored that they go back to this Sutro era, but they're not, they didn't pop up until the 1950s. So myth busted. Um, and then this is a scenario that keeps happening. <laughs> um, the funny thing is, is when, again, when you get a lot of press coverage, we're getting a lot of phone calls. Some people want to sell us things. Some people want to sell us things they also bought at the auction, which for the record, we're not doing. So sorry, we're not going to buy things from you. Um, People also want us to um, 
appraise things that they bought at the auction. And uh, we also don't do that. We legally can't appraise your items, um, just for the record. Um, but then some people want to donate things to us, like our little muse and um, reunite collections. So here's a, a stool, which I may not look impressive on the outside, but it is impressive. If you flip this little guy over, it is stamped AS for Adolf Sutro because it is one of the original stools to be in the Sutro baths. And you can see in this photo, I mean, this the Sutro baths was lousy with these little stools. Um, there were many, many, many. They lined all of the, um, the, the, the fencing on the upper levels. And we got another one. <laughs> We got another stool on the left. This is um, allegedly saved, um, um, pulled from the ashes of the Sutro Baths fire in, in 1966. This guy grew up with them um, and he, his sister, he and his sister both had them as their nightstands growing up. So this is his here. It was once painted green, which you can see on the underneath. His sister's was pink. And then he took it to college with him at SF State and painted it black because, you know, that's what you do when you go through an angsty counterculture youth at San Francisco State. And then incredibly, he's been using it for decades to teach kids woodworking in, in various classes in the Bay Area. And he made us a replica out of wood that was salvaged from the Kizar Stadium bleachers when the stadium was torn down. So, I mean, this is just so many layers of history. It's so, so cool that these pieces are finding their way to us. And I'm hoping he'll lead a, a workshop for us next year on how to make your own stool. Um, as long as you mark it not AS on the bottom like he did. Um, so we have all this really cool stuff now. <laughs> And um, now the hard work begins. Uh, we thought the hard work was gonna be fundraising for the auction. And as it turns out, that's not true. Now we're really doing the work. Um, we're starting to catalog pieces. Two, uh, we were able to acquire two Whitney era scrapbooks um, that are filled with hundreds of newspaper clippings. This is the first one we've started on. We have a volunteer who's photographed it and now indexing the individual um, clippings that we have in here. And she's making notes for me whenever she finds something pretty amazing, like when there was an explosion at the pie shop in 1936 that shot Halloween pie all over Great Highway. <laughs> So pretty incredible stuff, um, but also like for our, us historians, um, critical pieces of information like, oh, we have opened the ice rink at, at, Sutro's, at Sutro Baths. So there's also a lot of other weird stuff in here, chock-a-block full of things. And what's really cool is this is from the year that the Whitney's took over the Cliff House. So deeply historic items that um, we're in the process of cataloging. And, and we're also, or I should say Alex is also uh, hard at work <laughs> with conserving pieces like the oil portrait of Adolf Sutro, which you see here above our bear friend um, in the 1970s era Redwood room in the Cliff House. So Alex, why don't you give us a, a, a sneak peek at the work that you're doing? I will Vanna White him over <laughs> there. Um, yes, so uh, yeah, there's, um, I mean, there's so many concerning things, right? About a painting in a bar, um, above a fireplace, <laughs> by the ocean. Um, he's been well-loved is what I like to say about him. Um, I will say that, yes, this piece is at my studio that we can we can tell you that, um, and hopefully we're gonna be um, posting pictures and, and footage of his conservation on on my Instagram account on Act Art Conservation SF. And you can also follow the Save the Cliff House art Instagram handle. Uh, we'll kind of post them in tandem so that everybody can watch the journey um, of how he how he gets back to not looking so seasick. <laughs> um, I've, uh, I've said this before too, um, but just to go over why he's green, um, if anybody has ever gone to Europe and seen, uh, you know, altar pieces and, and uh, pieces in the, in the Uffizi, perfect example, um, people look a little seasick sometimes, they have sort of this green hue, 
um, that is referred to, the green color is referred to as imprimatura in Italian, which is an underpainting um, that you apply first as a painter before you apply flesh tones to make it look more lifelike. Um, and that's sort of like the, you know, your, your blood coming through your, your skin. Um, anyway, that uh, layer was, the, the top layer was scrubbed off by probably some well-meaning cleaning people at some stage. Uh, a lot of soda cleanings happened. Um, and so he just lost the, the skin tone layer. So he looks a little seasick, um, but he will not uh, coming soon to a theater near you. So um, just the, the brief overview of this is this canvas has seen some better days. Um, he's obviously, you can probably see in the light, but it's very cockled and distorted. Um, and the canvas was cut down at some point. So originally it was square and um, I'm seeing somebody asked soda cleaning means soda water um, bubbles um, or sometimes even baking soda. Um, so <laughs> it's just all sorts of all sorts of shenanigans. Um, but uh, so he the, the canvas was cut down it originally and it, it ends here it's tacking edge, which is the part that wraps around a wooden strainer a stretcher support uh, actually starts here and here and here and over here. Um, a lot of times what happened was people really liked the frame and they wanted to put something in a nice frame and so they would cut down or resize the canvas to fit a different looking frame. Um, so he was much bigger originally, or at least a fuller um, canvas. And unfortunately it was trimmed down all along its support. Uh, so the signature for the canvas for the artist would have been about right here, um, which isn't there anymore because it was cut off. Um, so we're still doing a little investigative reporting, which is one of my favorite parts of this job um, as to who could have possibly painted him. Uh, we have a couple candidates in the running from that time. Uh, something else is it's, you know, obviously because this first layer was skinned on his face, it didn't just happen here, it happened throughout the canvas. So he's been skinned, as we call it, which is probably a horrible term, but uh, we've, uh, it's, it's, its first layer has been removed. Um, uh, sort of throughout. Um, there's three buttons here that you should be able to see. You should see his shoulder joint much more clearly. Um, and all around the edge, all around here has been inpainted or retouched, which means that new paint and pigment has been applied to the canvas. Um, and that is because this wouldn't have been originally painted because the canvas stopped here. Um, and there are little nails that they've decided to tack on all along the edge of this on the face of the painting um, as well as glue it down to the stretcher um so this is all glued and has adhesive uh all on the back of it um and then they painted over the nails so that you couldn't see them which uh you know i like a challenge um and then i'll turn it around for you guys so that you can see um and this is the really cool thing, right, Alex? So the fact that we've taken the frame off of this, yes. we're able to see things that help us date it, maybe potentially figure out the artist, like yeah. this is the deep dive into how it was constructed, how it was painted, that might uh, daylight some answers people have um, wondered about for many years. Yes, definitely. And I also would just preface that um, if anybody ever turns a canvas around, um, the back of a canvas is its provenance papers, essentially, um, which means its origin. If you ever turn a painting around, you will find many, many different labels, usually on the back. Never, ever, 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 ever take a label off a canvas. <laughs> um, and so when it, its exhibition labels will be on there showing where it was exhibited, what private collections it was in, even the smallest label with a tiny little number on it means something. So never remove a label off a canvas. And if you're ever taking something to get framed, just PSA from a conservator, always, always, always make sure that you tell your framer if they don't already know this, and this isn't a professional frame shop, um, always let them know to keep the frame or to keep the labels 
um, and to transfer them onto the new dust cover onto the back, which is the paper that covers the back of the canvas. Um, because as it goes through time, those that's that's its passport of all of its different little stamps of where it's been. So, so where's he been? So we don't really know with this guy at all, other than that VAR photo. Um, <laughs> but I can tell you um, that the the verso is what the back of a canvas is called. Um, and this is, it's, you can see that there's a nice big patch on the back of it. Um, it's a canvas patch. It's um, the adhesive, if you will, or the uh, what has been used to put the patch on the canvas is beeswax. Um, it's not something that is commonly done now by a conservator. A conservator never ever used beeswax. Um, it's, it's very aggressive. Uh, it does not come off easily and seeps through to the front of the canvas, which is just likes to cause all sorts of problems. <laughs> um, people, you've probably encountered this before, but if a canvas ever, if you can kind of flick it and it sounds hard um, on the back of it, it's probably been lined with beeswax. Um, getting it off is never fun, but if it's small and it's isolated like this, that's um, a little, little bit easier. To, it's done with heat. Um, we do it on a vacuum heat table. Um, a lot of the times to reheat the wax, reconstitute it, and then slowly remove it with a tiny little spatula. Um, but as you can see, this was not done in any kind of a delicate way because <laughs> there's drip marks of beeswax all throughout it. So that's gonna be another challenge is to remove this patch where there's a corresponding hole and puncture into the front of the canvas and reline the entire canvas once we're able to get it off of this structure. Um, are off of off of its support. Um, and then we'll do a little um, you know cleaning, retouching to make sure that he doesn't look seasick. Um, <laughs> and then get him back in his frame and hopefully um, you know let him see another hundred plus years. The goal of any conservator is to um, preserve and conserve a work of art and protect it um, for, you know, for the foreseeable future with as little intervention as humanly possible. Um, there is a difference between a, a restorer and a conservator. Uh, restoration is returning something to its original state uh, by any means necessary, sort of. Um, and a conservator preserves the piece where it's at now, making sure that it's structurally sound and that its integrity is intact and that it's the, the artist's intention. Um, is as visible and as true as possible uh, with as little, little intervention as possible. And so as a conservator in private practice, and we sort of work in between that a little bit, um, but our goal really is to make sure that it's preserved in a historically accurate light as mm -hmm. to taking everything into account and all of those factors, um, and then making sure that um, he can, he can see the, uh, maybe not the inside of a bar over a fireplace anytime <laughs> soon, but definitely, um, get to see all of you guys. And um, there was a lot of challenges with the collection. Um, I can turn him back around. Um, but there were a lot of challenges with the with the collection um, in general. Um, because you're talking about with just with Adolf, right? You're talking yes. about like two years of work potentially, right? Uh, yeah. And I think that that's um, also given the fact that that, uh, you know, this is, this is, um, we do have clients that need right. things a little bit faster. So um, as much as I would love to dedicate all of my time just to him, I, I am in the middle of various different collections. So um, if I were just working on him straight, um, he would still probably take the better part of a year to be able to complete. Um, but we will, and yes, this will be a, a, a long journey for everybody to watch and be a part of. So, and if you have any questions, you, you know, anybody, please always send us a message on Instagram or, or email us and uh, we're happy to, happy to answer them. Yeah. And Alex runs the Instagram, by the way. So you, it's a, it's a direct pipeline to Alex. Um, any spelling errors, you can feel free to blame <laughs> me directly. <laughs> so. But we're, just look at this is just one piece of 104 right and not all the pieces are in as rough a shape um in fact some of the better pieces are uh are, that are can be displayed immediately have already uh are already um in the works to go up in the western neighborhoods project office but it's just something to keep in mind as you're all very excited to see these little babies again but we're trying to do this right we're trying to do it the right way make sure these pieces that have been in a in an um a rough environment are given are given the full spa treatment by Alex and her friends. Um, 
<laughs> but don't worry, we do have programming in the works. Um, first and foremost, we're working on exhibitions. Um, and this is a wonderful photo of Marilyn Blaisdell and her shop in the, in the Cliff House. Um, we are very fortunate to have many, many photos from her collection on OpenSF history. And so it feels like, for me at least, this feels like we're sort of continuing her legacy um, in programming around the Cliff House exhibition. So it's feeling, it's feeling right to me. Um, so exhibitions co-curated by our dear friend, John Martini. So it will be factually accurate. And of course, John Lindsay, who is our guru in displaying things. Cause if I were in charge, I would just put a million bajillion things up in the wall because I just love seeing it all in one place. So he's gonna make sure it looks great. We are refreshing our front windows at our office at 1617 Balboa Street near 17th Avenue in the Richmond district that will tell you the story that we of the auction and the pieces we were able to acquire. And then we'll be able to invite you in, hopefully by mid-June, fingers crossed, pandemic allowing, um, get your vaccinations. Um, uh, so you'll be able to see the first part of this collection on exhibition. But um, I'm very excited to announce that we did just submit a proposal to the National Park Service to install a temporary pop-up exhibition in the park. So fingers crossed that we will be able to display these pieces in a very appropriate location again. And I'm even more excited to announce that John Lindsay's totem pole will be staying in place at least for the time being. Um, and the National Park Service have been very supportive in working with us on this. This is not a normal thing to just leave a totem pole in a park that doesn't belong to them. So um, very excited about that too. And John Martini has signed on to lead uh, walking tours of the Sutro district area starting in this summer. So keep an eye on our website for our events um, page. And I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. Remember phones? Um, but um, so that's coming up um, and that's all from us. We're gonna stop talking now because we wanna hear from you now. Now you have the full picture of um, what we've been working on, mostly full picture of what we've been able to save. Now remember, we want you to press the little uh, uh, raise your hand icon and Arnold Woods will call on you. And you can also type questions in the chat and um, just to fill some gaps, if, 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 if there's a little bit of dead air, we've got slides queued up of some more things that we were able to save. So. No hands raised yet, but uh, we're looking for any questions or if you have suggestions of places to display stuff. Let us know. Um, uh, Dion Roberts, one of our new board members. Uh, why don't you unmute yourself, Dion, and- uh, Come on down. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Nice to see some of the folks that I've spoken to on the phone in person. Hi to Nicole, doing a great job facilitating this. Um, and forgive me if my question might have been discussed in the past at some previous conversations, but in regards to um, preserving and displaying the pieces, um, is there a plan to find certain places throughout San Francisco that would sort of shall we say adopt certain pieces or allow certain pieces to be displayed in lobbies and things like that? Or are we trying to get, you know, keep the exhibition together and have it displayed all in one piece? Um, that's gr a great question. Uh, and I, we promise we didn't seed that in advance. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the answer is all of the above. You know, we're really, we're really open to any opportunity to safely display the artifacts in a publicly accessible place. Um, some of the artifacts are very, very large. Uh, the, the Playland Cowboy is not gonna fit into every location. Um, uh, the totem pole, same. Uh, you know, I don't know that the totem pole will travel. Um, so, and the muses are very, very delicate and probably won't travel often. Um, if they do, they will be going for long-term exhibition places. So, but the goal is, yes, we're talking to folks from Rec and Park. We're talking to folks from the San Francisco Zoo. We're talking to city supervisors. 
Um, we're talking to local merchants who are opening spaces that might be appropriate um, thematically or, or by location. Um, and we wanna keep them in San Francisco. Uh, we have had offers from like UC Berkeley, things like that. Everybody wants the bear. Um, in case you're wondering what's the most popular item, <laughs> that bear has had many travel requests so far. He's also probably the heaviest thing we own. Um, so yeah, we're, we're open to any opportunities right now. Um, the key is gonna be keeping them safe, making sure that Alex has time to do the magic that she does first, because we don't want to further, um, we don't wanna put them back into a compromise situation that they just came out of. Right, right. Yeah, I will say that the, um, it's nice to meet you, Dion. Um, <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I, I will say that while, the pieces were definitely, you know, taken care of as best as they could have been. Um, they were by the ocean and there was, you know, a lot of them were exposed to the elements like the cowboy that the front doors were, he was right in front of the front doors and there was like a five inch gap on either side of the doors and he's metal. So, you know, um, but, and I'm, I'm seeing this a lot in the chat. Um, Museum Mechanique does exist for those who are looking at this, it does still exist. It's on Pier 45, I think, right? Is it? Um, and um, we have spoken with Museum Mechanique about the Cowboys and Dan has very generously and kindly um, offered that if he has the capacity that he would be uh, happy to help us uh, restore him back to his working condition um, because he does move. Um, and I actually, as a conservation uh, technician intern, um, few years ago, some, some years ago, uh, was part of the team that conserved the cowboy originally. So I'm very excited to be able to do that again with, with Dan, because now we have this, this added, um, component that we can potentially work with is to get him mobile. So yes, we're very, we're very open to all of those things to everyone. And that would be such an organic placement for this. Not only do people go there, um, you know, so many people visit that, that location, but it, the Musée Mechanique used to be in the Cliff House. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're not, we don't, we're, we're looking for places that feel right, not just trying to get them off our hands. Right. Um, but, um, but yes, our goal is to um, travel these babies as, as safely as possible so that maximum amount of people have access to them. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds like safety and accessibility are paramount. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And and remember to raise your hands if you have a question or a suggestion. There was a question in the chat from Rick about what the long-term plans for the totem pole might be. <laughs> um, well, um, uh, you know, temp temporarily it's, it's, it's going to remain in place, but, um, but we are speaking with district supervisors um, and asking them their opinion if they, if, if there are locations in their district um, on the west side that would feel appropriate. Um, we can't disclose those conversations yet um, since they're ongoing, but I can tell you that all three of us, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong here, like we feel like it needs to stay on the great highway. Um, it needs to stay on this side of town. This has been an icon that has welcomed visitors to Point Lobos for over 50 years. And um, we, we were working really hard to make sure it remains in place close by at the very least. I think John, you said it best that it's sort of like public art at this point that it sort of feels like it's, I don't know if you want to speak to that too, but. No, I mean, absolutely. It's, it, I mean, I think also building upon what you also talked about earlier, Alice, not necessarily today, but before is that the best thing for that is to stay in the, in the climate that it has gotten used to right mm -hmm. now. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, you know, there are all sorts of places from the cliff house to the zoo in that area that could be potential locations for it. Um, yeah. And that would be appropriate and really wonderful for it, so. And I, and I will add that the National Park Service isn't telling us, hey, get this off our lawn. Um, that's, that's not what's happening. Um, but there is, there is concern with its location. Um, Alex brought that up right away that it's not great that it's on a crumbling cliff. Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> that and that it's 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 a piece of it's from a tree. It was originally double the height that it is now. Um, and I think the first 
the top part of it succumbed to termites, as I understand. I think that's what oh, it's, it's had a wild history. Uh, yeah, Tom Martin is working on. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. I'm not 100 sure on that. Um, but the, um, you know, it's an organic material, and being out in the you know, and at the ocean, um, changing that drastically from that location into a museum storage or into, you know, cold storage somewhere or to a different part of the city, even. Um, I don't love the idea of having that move uh, just, uh, you know, as it's, as it's doctor. Uh, I don't love the idea of that, of that changing location that drastically. There's a lot of different things that could happen with that. Um, but, I think just, yeah, iconically and historically that belongs out at the, at the waterfront for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, we've got an eye on it. Um, and Nicole, just, I don't know if you want to talk about site specific stuff, but the, the, well, if we look at the chat, you know, a lot of people have, have talked about, you know, some have some excellent ideas. Some of them we've thought about as well. Um, we haven't approached the beach chalet people yet. Uh, or anybody in the park service. It's been more of the supervisors and where possibly it could be in an outdoor setting. Um, it's, uh, but I, I think, yeah, we're all agreed, um, Kate, that we, we want it as close to the cliff house and to the west side as possible. Yeah. And Alex is kept up at night brainstorming all kinds of contraptions to, to make sure it's safe, to make sure it's, it, we're, we're, no. we're, we're in this for the long haul. Um, and, and we also- and it, no yeah. cars, no vandalism. Mm -hmm. I know. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And we also only want to move it once because I don't know if you all have moved a lot of totem poles, but um, we haven't. And it's also best for the object to only move once to its new permanent location. So, um, and as Rob, uh, I just mentioned, yeah, we want it quite visible as well. We, we, you know, that's yeah. our whole mission is we want everything to be as visible as possible. Yeah. And, and to David's point, um, yeah, you know, the the park service is letting us nicely keep it there uh, right now, which is a huge help to us. Um, but yeah, that that might not last forever. So it is it is a concern. You know, this is obviously the concern is, you know, where ultimately will will it reside? And just to let you know what we've taken on, like, oh, sure, we bought a totem pole. Um, but now we're going to have structural engineers go out to make sure that it's stable. We have to insure it. We'll be the ones carrying liability insurance on this. So, um, so feel free to yell at anybody that you see. That <laughs> tell people to get off our totem pole. <laughs> So like, you know, it's one thing to buy something at auction and it's, it's quite another to um, be buy a totem pole. <laughs> and to buy a totem pole auction. But to be it's, it's, um, it's thoughtful stewards and um, just not to, you know, harp on this, but we really took on a lot here and we're so happy we did because this is, it's incredible that it's able to remain on the West side as an icon for future generations. Um, and I thank you for monitoring the chat. I can't see it. I'm like on full screen mode. So, and yes, there has been a structural, I, I'm just seeing the chat. Um, there, there has been a, a mild uh, structural analysis done um, by Minnesota Street Projects, who's taken a look at it. Uh, in, in that regard, we're having a structural engineer um, come and take a look at it um, this week or next week um, that will draw up some thoughts on that. Um, right now it is structured between two um, steel support beams. Uh, it's lifted up above ground slightly on a um, cement platform, uh, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, but yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it's on a cliff, it's on the seashore. The coastal erosion is a very real thing. Um, the beach chalet, I know a lot of people are talking about that. Um, while that would be an amazing option and we have had some discussions about other solutions for other things with rec and park. So they're very wonderful people that are very invested in this project. Um, I personally, am, you know, and I think we've all talked about this, but safety is, you know, my number one concern because, as the doctor for all of the pieces, I'm going to tell them, you know, yeah, that's not, I don't love that you're going skydiving, but hey, you know, you can try it. <laughs> um, but uh, so for, for me with that kind of aspect, having it back in the park chalet, that's not visible to anybody that's back there from the beachfront. Uh, for one thing, it's not, you know, vis just visible for enjoyment, but it's also unprotected back there. And I personally like that it's in a visible location out on grid highway where people won't be vandalizing it or um, 
having any interactions with it that may not be, you know, in front of the world and they'd have that sort of accountability for it. So I, I don't love the idea of having it be back behind a building um, for several different reasons, um, but it's definitely a, a, a thought for in front of it. If we can find a, a spot up front out, out there, then, then yes, but I'm saying that a lot. I just wanted to address it for everybody. So besides the totem pole, uh, David Volansky wanted to know if the Beach LA might be a possibility for other items in the collection. It's on our list to uh, explore. Definitely. I, I have to um, I confess to you that the um, very sad exhibitions that have been in the downstairs part of that have been a dream of mine to refresh for uh, as long as I've been a, a wee historian in San Francisco. I'm not saying we've had any of those conversations, but I have thought of it. <laughs> Um, so excellent. It's great. We're all on the same page, y'all. This is amazing. Yeah. Um, definitely on the same page. And as we're waiting for more questions to come in, um, we've got some slides queued up that show you some of the other pieces we were able to save with the help Not of our dance routine. Huh? <laughs> I would go for it, Alex, but um, I kind of feel like people want to see more of the collection first. <laughs> Bummer. Not to throw shade. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. But um, you know, Adolf Sutro is um, as a main part is is very well represented in the collection items we were able to acquire from books. The man loved books. Um, also, just I mean, this these are the things we think about. We've been staring at these for so long, and Adolf Sutro seemed to surround himself with a lot of um, a scantily clad uh, goddesses in all parts of his life, which I never put together until reviewing all of these. And Alex pointed out in this photo. <laughs> The little muse or the little lady on the right, um, he's actually a got, nightmare. <laughs> he's like tied the drape to her foot just to uh, keep it open and let the light in. So um, <laughs> that's not ideal, right, Alex? <laughs> I, you know, I, I plead the fifth on a lot of things that clients I've walked in, you know, I am that person that will walk into your home and come out of the <laughs> your restroom with like, I'm just going to move this away from the bathroom, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, this is yeah exhibit a, this would be me untying her ankle in his home, but, um, so yeah, that, taking, was a, that was a nice catch. That was we're good. taking better care of these things that even Adolf did. Um, we but, do do preventative medicine as contributors. <laughs> Please don't just bring us something once it's broken. We do also do preventative care. But this book is beautiful. It has so many incredible etchings in it of, of, the, of the West Side that we love so much. So we're excited for folks to be able to see that. We also were able to acquire this album of Sutro Heights, which has a wonderful catalog of all the different statuary that was once up there. And, um, and here's a picture of Adolf with some of his ladies. And I can't tell if it's a child or one of his monkeys, which is a true thing that he had monkeys at Sutro Heights. I, can't, I really can't tell, um, but this book is exceptionally beautiful. I, I just, I can't even begin to describe how, how gorgeous the artwork is in there. Um, are there any other questions or do you want me to? Not uh, yet, but uh, can I ask you that, that picture of Sutro there looks a lot like the portrait only reversed. Huh. It does. Huh. It has not gone unnoticed. Yes, yes, yes. You know, we've seen a lot of uh, portrait cards of him in profile. Um, fun fact, does anybody know why he has those sideburns? Those massive mutton chops? Ooh, Ed <laughs> does. Ed, do you want to tell us? Ooh, Ed, you're muted. Uh, there we go. Hi. Uh, I believe he gave some poor stock advice to an investor <laughs> who became angry and attacked him with a knife. Oh. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> See, history is crazy. <laughs> There's that expression, you know, I'll paint, take, take the picture, capture me on my good side um, from, uh, if anybody, little, little Florentine nerd knowledge, um, Duke of Urbino, he and his wife, there's two portraits of him, them, like the famous profile shots, like the first ones. Um, and it's because he was missing an eye. See? So oh, yeah, there's all these all these secret reasons as to why people are positioned the way they are. <laughs> Don't poke the bear. <laughs> Don't poke the bear or sit on him. Or sit uh, on him because he has very delicate Edwardian casters, Nicole. 
That's why I can't move him. Yes, I know. Those things are frozen. Um, we also were able to acquire some posters uh, that announce events at Sutro Bass, even as early as 1897. And here's a shot from Open SF History that just blows me away every time of, of <laughs> Sutro's empire. You can see his cliff house and his Sutro Baths and all that he gave to San Francisco that is all gone. All of it's gone. <laughs> Burned down, fell down, torn down by the city, all gone. And then, of course, the big stars of the show, which were the Sutro Baths bathing suits. Um, for the record, they're not for sale and we don't want to buy yours. Um, people have been asking. So I'm just going to put that donate out there. And, you know, it's a, we would love it. But yes, I'll, I, 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 yes. Alex has done a lot of work on these already. Alex, I don't know if you want to talk about <laughs> why uh, bring your care. <laughs> Sure. Now that now now I am now able to speak to that. Um, but the um, the pieces that were uh, stolen um, at the first break in of the Cliff House post um, closure, uh, if you will, um, were all recovered, um, with the exception of one ship model, I think. Um, but these two are two of the pieces uh, along with the carousel horse um, that were stolen and recovered. And once those pieces uh, were recovered, they did come here for conservation treatment. They were, um, a lot of the pieces were water damaged, um, but we were able to um, preserve them and make sure that they were stable and okay. Luckily, I, I, I find the, you know, the irony of, um, uh, water damage in swimsuits I hear yeah <laughs> but they were um they're they're wool and they were in frames uh so there there were some issues um and uh it definitely was a little uh you know uncomfortable or sad and and anxiety inducing to conserve all of these pieces and then turn them back over to the auction house so that they could go back to auction so that we could all bid on them um okay. But, okay. Uh, yeah it was very like thank you so much okay here you go um so but but luckily we were, we were able to capture these two back into into our care and our collection so yes we do we do have these two two pieces we wish we could have gotten more but um we do in there the are someday when y'all when we're all together again and, and drinking in person together I'll tell you about the things that I'm upset we didn't get but that's not we're not here to talk about negative things we're here to talk about positive things Love. and if anybody does have those you know other pieces too that they that they would like to bequeath or set up in some way that can go into this collection as a trust later on um, please contact us and reach out there's a lot of things that fall to the way of history that it's because their heirs or the, you know, people in their lives don't know what it is um, and have a hard time identifying and then they might give it to the Goodwill or throw it away. And um, we are, you know, even if you'd like to hang on to it now for, uh, you know, a period of time in your life, but you would like it to come to us later and be reunited with the full collection, please reach out now so that we can try and set that up and make sure that that happens. We do that all the time with people um with their art collections and we would be honored to make sure that whenever you're ready for those pieces to rejoin their their fellow pieces of history <laughs> that we can set that up to make sure that happens it's so true and some folks have already come forward and we're, we're having those conversations yeah. um and, and this is one of my favorite pieces uh, i about lost lost my mind when uh, um, Orly, the auction uh, coordinator, casually was like, oh, there's so many from a presidential visit. And I was like, which one? Which one? Was it Taft? Was it McKinley? Was it Roosevelt? <laughs> and it was Roosevelt. And incredibly, we have a photograph from the special luncheon from his visit on Open SF History. That's what you see on the left. And if you look closely, you'll see these menus sitting on the flower beds waiting for um, their very illustrious uh, owners to come to come sit down and that blows my mind that these I mean there were only a handful of these made and we have one and it's beautiful it is and Alex is going to make it look even better than it does right now <laughs> looks beautiful <laughs> Um, I'm a huge nerd about Teddy Roosevelt. We can talk about that more later, but um, I want to make sure that you all have an opportunity to have to voice all of your opinions and ask all your questions. Questions, concerns, comments, mm -hmm. thoughts? No? 
Anyway. No, crickets. Okay, well, let's just keep going through this tour. You know what else we got? <laughs> There's a lot of questions, I will tell you, Nicole, coming up, it looks like, about the monkeys. Oh, Lord. You want to address. Oh, oh so, um, oh, the uh, monkeys. Well, we have many photos of um, Sutro's monkeys on, on our website. I will say. Um, oh, David just posted one. Oh, great. Oh, David just posted a monkey photo to the chat. Um, to heads up, like this is pre SPCA, you know, uh, animal rights activists. So like, I'm sure they were well taken care of. I actually don't know that, but they aren't, they're going to look a little chained up. So, um, just uh, not a know, little trigger, trigger warning trigger. Um, yeah, he had, he had monkeys. He had all kinds of crazy things. Um, yeah. at Sutro Heights. Um, but, um, oh, that's the thing that we all glommed onto, huh? The monkeys. Hmm. Yep. That was ran with, <laughs> you know, um, we can, we can all have discussions about that much later. Adolf Sutro, very interesting man. George Whitney, also a very interesting man. Um, in fact, a lot of the um, sort of hyperbolic uh, promotions that we connect to Playland at the Beach and Sutro Baths and the Cliff House are because George Whitney was a master promoter. Um, and we talked about the scrapbooks earlier, but we also have these Western Union um, telegrams, which um, some of our younger viewers won't know what they are, but um, they're all they're all wishing George Whitney happy birthday in 1947. And I started looking at them, and incredibly, a lot of them are care of Albert Roller, who um, is the famed architect of the Masonic Temple on on Sloat. So um, I guess he was just hanging out at Roller's house in Hillsboro for his birthday in 1947. So telegrams had to go there. Haven't verified that, need to double check, but that's maybe that's, that's more of the ongoing work with this collection. Um, and the Whitney era is, uh, I think my favorite era, although I don't wanna throw shade on Sutro cause he did build all these buildings, but here's something else that's really cool. Uh, we acquired this much larger than I remembered ship's wheel that hung in, um, <laughs> hung in the cliff house since the 1940s um, or maybe the 30s. We haven't quite dated this photo yet, but allegedly this wheel is from one of the shipwrecks, um, either the Ohioan or the Frank Buck that happened right out here at Land's End. And this etched mirror matches the, the mirror backings to the former bar that was in this same part of the cliff house, which we also were able to acquire one of. I wanted all five. But um, that bidding went crazy. Uh, and so we did not acquire all five. Um, but those all are allegedly made from, um, uh, allegedly Ansel Adams was commissioned to make all of these etched mirror uh, photos. So we have to do some research on that, but um, still pretty cool that we found this photo from the late thirties, early forties that shows it in situ because it's the first time I've ever seen that. Um, also, can't emphasize this enough. It's so big. It's so, it was, so big. I will never forget your face walking in going, oh, that was bigger than I. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. The auction listing said wheels. And I was like, oh my God, is there another one? Oh God, I hope there's not another one. There's there not. Were, it's just there one. were some, some misnamed auction titles. Yes. Um, and there's John Lindsay's totem pole again. Um, well, doubled its size. Um, but we also acquired lots of um, really cool things like, like menus from all eras of the Cliff House from like the earliest 1880s through the 1960s. And we got a Thanksgiving one and we got a Christmas one because what better place to spend the holidays than everyone's favorite restaurant. Um, and then these are super cool. I haven't, these are three autographed Mater D's um, bibs. And we haven't done the work of figuring out all the signatures on them, but Cary Grant is one of them, which made me very excited. Um, and you also, speaking of Whitney lore, so this is, this is the Whitney era and you'll see on the, on the um, I was gonna say chimney, but that's not what it is. It says Whitney's in beautiful neon lettering. It also says since 1858, and that's not true. Cliff House opened in 1863. So, you know, history, schmistery, um, <laughs> it's close enough. That's why our investigative reporting efforts have been so 
thwarted from time to time because there's a lot of showmanship with these things. I wanted to respond to Kate. Um, she asks, uh, who, knows, who knows what the plans are for the Cliff House with the MPS, uh, but if and when it does reopen to the public, some kind of partnership with some of the items. Um, so, you know, currently there is a request for, for, for proposal that they had out that they wanted another large concessionaire to take over the Cliff House, Louis, and the Lookout Cafe. That has been suspended because of COVID and they are reassessing those plans. Um, we really don't know, you know, I, I think ideally they want somebody just to come in and help them take care of it and that they don't want to chop it into small blocks and have different leases. But right now they're just on a complete pause with the whole thing. Uh, and we have been in discussions with them about how we can partnership going forward with them. And they're very amenable that and, and have helped us with that. And so I, I think there's gonna be some cool things where we're actually gonna end up working with the MPS. Yeah, and I was remiss in not mentioning that. Um, so I worked with the, for the museum program at the GGNRA for 13 years and like have buddies who still work there and they're very excited to work with us and display National Park Service artifacts related to this area, Cliff House, Sutro, um, Sutro Heights, um, so that we'll be able to present both of our collections together. And let me tell you, they have super cool things. They have super, super cool things and don't have a lot of opportunities to display them. Yeah, one, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I, was, I was just gonna say there's there's one thing that we'll never put on display because it's a health hazard, but they have like a stuffed seal from the original Sutro Baths that's just riddled with all kinds of chemicals and it's mm -hmm. shedding actively, but- Please don't um, bring that here. <laughs> no, I won't, I won't put him near Sutro's portrait, I promise, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> or just me in general. No, uh, I, but yeah, I was gonna say that I know a lot of people have, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, you know, emotion tied up with this, which I absolutely respect. And God knows that I am <laughs> the top of the line with that. Um, but working with, you know, I think that's what made this work and what made this so successful was that we really made sure to work with all parties that had the best intention for the history and for the pieces moving forward. Um, and from a historical standpoint and from a conservation standpoint, um, keeping the items as site specific as possible is definitely our goal. These pieces tell a story of the Cliff House. They definitely belong at the Cliff House and no one would dispute that fact. If we can work something out where they would be safe physically um, from either break-ins or elements or other things, um, if we can ensure their, their safety and of course their um, you know, that, that history going forward, we, we want to work with all parties that would be able to make that happen for us. And like Nicole said, um, the opportunity that is presenting itself of being able to marry two collections together that originally were one collection is a very, very rare opportunity. Um, I, I can't even tell, I mean, most of European art has been split up, never to be seen ever together again. Um, so the fact that, that we have the opportunity to have these pieces reunited with the pieces that are in the NPS collection, it's really in my line of work and Nicole's and John's too, um, and just as San Franciscans, I feel like it's our responsibility to do so and to make sure that if we have the opportunity to present the collection as intact as possible, Doing it on NPS land um, actually just logistically works in a way that we wouldn't have to have those pieces on loan to us where we are paying insurance on them, where we are taking that and absorbing that into our collection, that we are actually able to have both collections displayed together in unison as they were intended to and to tell more of the story of these pieces. And I think it's really important that all, you know, thoughts on everything aside, as long as we're making sure that we are doing right by our history and right by the objects, that's the most important thing. Um, and the NPS have been nothing but supportive of that. So we're, we're very grateful to them, but. I think, I think also something, something to remember about that request for proposal is that anyone who goes into the Cliff House is required to have cultural heritage programming inside mm -hmm. of that Cliff House. And that's something that we're hoping um, happens and that we can be a part of. 
Yes. Yeah, I keep saying that uh, we want to play with all the kids in the sandbox. Um, and we should also say that once we started, to, even before we entered into conversations with the National Park Service, we let the Hontalas family know, like, hey, just just full disclosure, like I we're we're pursuing this avenue. And Mary Hontalas was like, great, yeah, when, you know, I hope it works out for you. So um, we've worked really hard to make sure everyone feels okay in this very complicated situation yeah. um, because we really are just here for the history. History um, is neutral. Yeah. History and is it, Switzerland. And it has to be in times when we personally wish that it wasn't. Um, I think that that's definitely a thing uh, that, you know, and I think Nicole, that may segue into your next couple of slides that, um, well, yeah, I think, I think neutrality, a, neutrality also and, has a, question here which is is there a budget plan for taking care of these pieces in perpetuity it's you yes. guys yeah. well no <laughs> i mean i'm that's, kidding I'm that's kidding. something that we're putting together absolutely yes. and that we are you know going to have to start fundraising again for so we we really yeah. haven't stopped fundraising right but, but right now because we're putting the plans together absolutely you know we are going to have to fundraise more for for keeping taking care of these these pieces in perpetuity Absolutely, and that will include um, strategic grant applications, um, which uh, we've already got one in, hoping it comes in next year. Um, come on, grants for the arts. I don't know if you're here tonight, but uh, we need your help. Uh, <laughs> NEA. Also, yeah. you know, also yeah. that, Nicole, too, is that that also includes donations and services because like Minnesota Street Project and Lawrence Fine Arts, and um, I know that there are people here tonight also um, that specialize in museum lighting and things like that. If you provide a service, um, please don't think of donations purely as monetary because True. this is a community effort. And I think really like the physical uh, rolling up of your sleeves and getting in there in whatever capacity you're able to, if you're able to paint a fence and we may need that at some point, <laughs> come on down the street. I mean, really it's, I, I can't, I don't know. <laughs> the outside of the cliff house. No, I don't know. Um, no. <laughs> it was the first thing that came to mind. Um, no, but seriously, if there's a service that you provide or something that you're like, I don't know how to donate or I can't donate monetarily, but I have this other skill or you notice something that we don't, please bring it up or email us, call us, let us know because I just really want to stress that, that there's a lot of people that are writing in on the Instagram account that are saying things like, you know, I don't have the money to donate, but I'd love to help out. How can I do that? We definitely have all the ways. We need things cataloged and photographed and, you know, all sorts of things. So, so if you're, if you're interested in helping out, please raise your hand. I think this, it's not just about financial mm -mm. donations um, as much as those would definitely help because some things just unfortunately cost money. Um, yes. And also, I, we should say that Minnesota Street Project is is part of our our, our long term marriage here. Yes. Um, for the dream team, they're willing to to store these things long term for us, um, help us transport these items whenever they have to go on the road. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's truly incredible how they stepped up to support our effort and the broader effort of saving historical artifacts like this. We'll, we'll kind of preview that in a little bit. But um, but yes, this is. Um, a lot of people don't know that we're a one employee organization, one employee um, that uh, that is supported by a small army of incredibly dedicated volunteers. And so volunteers are really what gets all the work done at Western Neighborhoods Project and that's not gonna change now. Um, but we, so we acquired pieces from this collection strategically and it's with a long view to many different diverse voices and um, a complex past, right? So it's not just, oh, yay, like, you know, it's it's um, it's who worked there. We've got, we've got the Mater D bibs, which um, we showed earlier. We've got this amazing 1950s waiter's cap. That's just the most beautiful thing um, um, safely in Alex's care right now. Um, and uh, we also have a tea tin that's super cute and it's got a painted, uh, I don't have a photo of it for you, unfortunately, but it has a painted uh, side to it. Very, very cute. Um, I love this one. As somebody who lives on Great Highway physically, I need one of these. This is, um, so at one point the Whitney's advertised this as the largest gift shop in the world. <laughs> 
Um, I'm not sure about that, but I also haven't fact check it. Um, but um, this is one of the novelty items you could purchase. Although this amazing photo shows a whole, um, a, just sundry of novelty items that you could have purchased. And a lot of bicycles, very high up. So those are, I, I believe, part of the museum, Sutro's museum that was once there. Um, it, it must have been bright in there because I always focus in on this woman in full sunglasses right in the center. She's looking great, right? I would wear every single thing she's wearing. That um, track lighting. And there's also two people on the right wearing sunglasses as well. Yes. <laughs> A couple. Nick they, and had Laura. Good, they had good lighting, John. They had, that was some <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Okay, go but on. so cute that we get to tell the story of the gift shop, um, which is not always, you know, sometimes it's a complicated story. Um, you know, the way the way we once displayed other cultures as as um, exotic is um, not what we do anymore. I can assure you that. And this is also a very important part of the story. These are two wood carvings that were on display for a very long time in Sutro's museum and then got shifted over to the gift shop, mm -hmm. um, something they advertised greatly and before you all start asking I don't know if you are but like I, I'm not well informed of the full history of these pieces give us some time to give you a thoughtful history yeah. on them um, and no I don't know where they are <laughs> um, yeah, sure. but this is you know this this is part of the longer broader uh, range of history that we're uh, documenting here along with super racist imagery attached to one of the Whitney's earliest concessions at Playland Topsy's roost, which was, it was supposed to emulate walking into a chicken coop, right? Um, and there would be um, bands playing. There was a giant dance floor, which you can see. And this is the menu that we, we did acquire at auction. Um, it, was, it was massive. And um, they often, I've heard of reports of bands playing in full blackface. So um, these yeah. are other stories we're able to tell through this collection. It's not just um, history's complicated and we're here to tell, we're here to talk about it. Um, yeah, and I would just mention too, as a conservator, um, there's, uh, this, is, this is absolutely a conversation that's gone on throughout history and especially relevant right now, which is an absolutely incredible thing and needs to be spoken about more. Um, but, you know, I would just mention that nothing feels worse as a conservator to have to conserve something like this. Um, to conserve, I've personally conserved uh, Nazi propaganda posters um, that have felt awful to have to save. Um, but the reason the Holocaust Museum exists, the reason that these things are preserved is so that we don't go backward. Um, so that we don't continue to relive this, so that there is a physical representation of this on record. Um, it's incredibly important to us. Um, part of our job, it's much like a doctor where you, you know, treat the patient right in front of you. It's um, not always, um, I mean, it's something that a lot of the time makes our stomachs turn, um, something that is upsetting to have to know that you're saving. Um, but things like this are incredibly important. And I invite everyone into this conversation because erasing these things um, does nobody any good. Uh, we need to make sure that we remember exactly what happened, exactly what does happen, um, and make sure that we highlight that and talk about that part because you really have to feel it to heal it. Um, and, uh, I just invite anybody to, if you have any questions on that for, for us that, that you, you know, can feel free to speak to us about it. It's something that's very, um, present in our minds. And I know that there's a lot of conversations around Mr. Sutra himself, who's sitting right next to me. Um, these are men of their time that definitely, um, you know, today's world, I'm happy to say doesn't display things in this way now and we're nowhere near where we should be but we're you know it's a whole different conversation um but the reason why we are preserving these things the reason why we purchase them at auction the reason why we have absorbed these into our collection is vital and important and i know that some people may think 
why did you save that? That thing is absolutely horrible and atrocious and should not at all be something that we spend money on saving. Um, but I would invite you to think of the necessity of it in a different way, that it is actually incredibly vital that we protect and save these things um, so that there is a physical representation. Because as we all know, there are times when people um, question if things happened, don't believe in things happening, don't I haven't lived through it, you know, honestly, um, people that are younger or that, you know, we're not a generation that lived during World War II, that we're not a generation that lived, you know, before that or that we're part of that. San Franciscans, I think, were very um, sometimes removed from those things because San Francisco is not always, you know, that that place, but here it is in our city. And um, I think- And it's a tool, right, right Alex? Like, exactly, exactly. It's a tool. tool. It's a teaching it's a tool, tool and it's, 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 it's a tool for conversation. And then that's, that's what history is. It's an ongoing conversation. Um, yes. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, yes. um, not to immediately segue into something that's extremely frivolous and fun, but, um, but here he is sheriff. See you soon. Yes. Yes. Rootin' tootin'. Um, we also have his little gun, which I was told was actually removed from him because the National Park Service did not want any kind of endorsement of firearms on their premises, which I think is really interesting. Um, he used to have two guns. He only has one now, but, um, but Alex has a long history of, of making sure he's treated properly and will continue that history. Um, I would be remiss to uh, not mention, by the way, there was a tiny bird nesting in his uh, hat during the entire time that, so, when I got up there on the ladder just now to, as we were taking him out, we found her home. Yes. I feel bad evicting her, but. Yeah, we, we evicted a tiny bird, uh, which is the uh, the dark side of the Cinderella story that is this, is this situation. Um, <laughs> and we were able to acquire this really, really um, beautiful advertisement for Oxidol Week at Playland at the beach. Um, um, I don't know what it, uh, you got free Oxidol. I mean, that's pretty exciting. Um, and a Hawaiian vacation, Nicole. And a, uh, I think that's if you, different. If you won, if you won with the, what was it? CNH? It's CNH. Trigger. Trigger. Yeah. How it large is it. an Oxidol too? You get one large Oxidol. One large Oxidol. In full disclosure, there were two Playland posters uh, at auction and I really wanted the other one and that went crazy expensive super fast. So in the middle of the auction when we were going, it was Arnold and I in the office and I, I was like, oh, abort, abort, it's too expensive. And Arnold was like, go for the other one. And I, uh, or I was like, I need to go for the other one. And Arnold was like, really? Do we have to buy it? <laughs> Can we take a moment to talk about um, your auction skills? Oh, I wouldn't call them skills. Um, um, I don't know. Yeah, I wouldn't call them skills. Um, we, second day, uh, second day was skills. First day was Nicole I, is the proud owner of several hundred different types of glasses. Yeah, I didn't understand. Oh boy, this is going to be on the internet. But, uh, but um, the first day of the auction for glassware and barware, I didn't quite understand that. Um, when you put in your maximum bid price at a live uh, internet auction that, that you have bid on that. So um, no, take backs. I, no take backs, just so everyone here is aware, no take backs. <laughs> um, and luckily I was outbid on almost all the things I put in a maximum bid on, on the day. So we don't own. Um, you will all be going home with a wonderful, what is it, Nicole? What, tell, so tell people what's under all, their chairs? For all of you who donated to um, uh, to, to our cause, uh, when we do have an exhibition opening, which you will get first dibs at, uh, you will also be able to claim your prize, which is either a Irish coffee mug uh, or a champagne glass or a mug from the Cliff House, thanks to my poor auction skills on day one. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, by day two, we had figured out not to do that. And I had Arnold with me. Wait, we, we figured out. <laughs> we did the team effort, Alex. <laughs> um, don't worry, day two went a lot better. And that's why we were able to save really amazing things like this streetcar placement um, yeah. ad that used to be on all the streetcars that ran out here um, that advertised the ice skating rink at Sutro's, which is one of my personal favorite storylines in Sutro baths. One of the things I really wish was still there. I don't ever really had an urge to swim in those wool swimsuits, but yeah. this I was all about. Um, 
And then, you know, so that was the Whitney era. And now, and we also have a few things from the Hantalis area, our era. And ma many folks don't know that the Hantalis family, there were two branches of them. And they operated businesses on this stretch of Point Lobos for decades. And I, this is the first time that there is no Hantalis business in this area since I want to say the 30s, maybe earlier. Um, we have a podcast on it on the closing of Louis. So, um, so, and uh, this kind of stuff is what I really get attached to. It's the archivist at heart. Um, one of the early Hantalis concessions was Danny's Cliff Chalet that you see here next to Sutro Baz. And uh, I'm just a breakfast person. So I love seeing the different types of menu items. We have a lot of menus that we were able to acquire. Um, and I really like the pancake motif here. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, again, we've been talking a lot and that's not the point of this session. Um, although I know people are answering questions in the chat. I hope that I can't see. Um, uh, let's see. No, I think we're pretty caught up here. Yeah. 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 They would like some pictures of the glasses of, you know, <laughs> I mean, they're, um, you know, they're not deeply historic. I just want to put that out there. They're just like, imagine a coffee diner mug. Yep, there it is. That's what it looks like. Imagine I have my, yes, I, I, I love that mug. And, and we do mug. have to find some boxes of Oxidol too. <laughs> yeah. so. Oh! Have you seen this one? Oh yeah, yeah. That's awesome. That's I can, awesome. I can awesome. assure you ours aren't that nice. <laughs> yeah, no, ours are just a straight there's, diner mug. Um, yeah, there, there's no markings on them yeah, indicating no. that they're from the Cliff House. No, we just bought them at the auction, so we know they're yeah, from the Cliff House. Pretty empty on the bottom too. It doesn't compare to John Lindsay's totem pole, but <laughs> <laughs> I actually um, bought it. Um, this was just before the current. Um, Cliff House that we have now when the old one was going to oh, go. Oh, 2004, I think. Did yeah. they redo that? Yeah. yeah. And they did a little sale of some stuff that they had. And so I went in there and I found, you know, a mug. But it has a really good saying on the back of it, which is kind of neat. It's uh, quoting Mark Twain from some 1864 writings of his. Wow. Uh, coldest, says, coldest winter? If you go to the Cliff House, <laughs> At any time after seven in the morning, you cannot fail to enjoy it. <laughs> you know. Before that, before that, will you send that to us? Will you, e will you send us a picture? Yeah, yeah, I, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny. I don't even really remember this iteration of the um, of the uh, the the branding. Um, but it, you know, it's it's pretty modern, I guess. You know, we there's a there was a sign that that had that exact. Really? iconography on it inside yeah okay. that was that's cool that's, that's awesome. um no, please that's, that's a photo of that that's awesome i thought it was going to be the coldest winter in san or the what is it the coldest winter i ever had was a summer in san francisco yeah i don't think that's actually mark twain but i don't want to be there was it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I yeah always love that one. it actually says that it's um mark twain and it's early rising as regards excursions to the city. <laughs> Nic plus. Nicole, yeah, didn't he a, visit the Cliff House a couple of times? You had something on that? The writing is fading, so that's why I'm my my reading is a little delayed as I try to make <laughs> it out. But but yeah. Oh. <laughs> Dion, I, we might have to remake those. Uh, yeah. We have jokingly um, suggested, uh, I have jokingly suggested that we need to put our um, our double-fisted pup stuffer on on a on a mug uh, as a merchandise option. I really I would really like the Sutro bath uh, bathing suits as tank tops. So. Oh yes, very nice. Those very would be fun. Nice. Yeah, but you know we do have a lot of our plates, so I don't think creating new merchandise is like that's John. Cool. That's all John. John. John is going to screen print the bejesus out of everything. Um, <laughs> Well, I, the chat, Nicole, did the Hontalis family run the Sky Tram? Oh, Sky Tram! Gosh, you hit on one of my favorite things. No, that was a Whitney era concession. It was only around for oh, like 10, 12 years. John Martini wrote a great article on it for our membership magazine, which is a benefit of membership when you become a member of Western Neighborhoods Project. 
I also um, believe there's a very early podcast about it. Yes. That Skytram, if I could recreate anything, it would not be that Skytram. Because <laughs> It, uh, it's it the looked, shortest tram in the world. It goes like 10 feet, like across, I mean, like, yes. I never really thought about that. Yeah, it <laughs> go like, like just. It was did it, very did it slow. Hover? Did it hover? Did it like go it, and then stop? At like very, very slow. It would break down a lot. So oh, it, yeah, it did stop, um, but it did take you to the tallest seawater waterfall in the world. <laughs> Um, yeah, Whitney was a great showman, um, but um, sometimes his ideas didn't pan out quite how that he thought. It never made money and they ended up taking it out. But, um, but yes, uh, many photos of the Skytram on Open SF History if you wanna go yeah, and, to that. And you can still go out to the overlook mm -hmm. across from Sutro Baz and see the base of it. Yep. And you can see the gnarled bolts that held on to the base of it. And they're very impressive. I don't know how anybody bent those bolts when they did, but. Yeah. If you sign up for John Martini's walking tour, I believe it'll be in June of the Cliff House and Sutra Baz area. He will tell you all about it himself. And he's the true expert on all of these things. I just repeat what I hear from him. Um, so, and that's a great segue into what's next. Uh, What's next are all the things we've already talked about, right? But um, I mean, I, I'm not being facetious when I say I, I am very much in love with our, our partners in this effort and can uh, will be married to them for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. And part of the discussion that got brought up uh, with the Cliff House auction is, why isn't there a San Francisco History Museum that is going to acquire and save these things? And the short answer is, well, there just isn't one. <laughs> there yeah. isn't one. Yet, um, and I don't know that there ever will be a formal museum like we think of, right? Like going into a giant MoMA area. Um, uh, but we are having, starting to have conversations with all kinds of people about what an appropriate way forward there will be to respond to situations like this in the future, not in a panic two weeks notice fundraising drive with a bunch of strangers coming together and going, hope this works out, they seem nice. Um, they, turns out they are nice and everybody's great, but um, you know, we're talking about a way forward that supports all of the community his history groups that are already in existence, that um, no questions asked salvages key pieces of our cultural heritage and keeps them safely stored for future generations. And um, it's something I've been uh, thinking about for a very long time, kind of wrote my thesis on this. And I very, don't be modest little bit um have been thinking about it for a long time but um don't go read that thesis it's not very good uh yeah. uh but the ideas are solid uh so <laughs> but um it's very exciting to to be the steward of this collection to work with alexandra knowing that these pieces will <laughs> have the best care possible to work with john Lindsay to know that they will be uh presented to you um, with full John Martini historical context in, in the most exciting way possible, beautiful and in context, and um, to, to be at the table for what's next for San Francisco history, because this city is amazing, this history is amazing, and we have an opportunity to be at the cutting edge of what culture can do to inspire community. So, um, and John, if any, if any of you guys have ideas on that or have connections, I'm seeing some stuff in the chat, like, please reach out to us because this is a community effort from start to finish. So this is how we get that done. And John Lindsay is working actively on some very exciting developments in the Sunset District as well. So what we're trying to do is create a cultural heritage district in the outer Sunset. In May, we'll be having a public forum about this, but this is something that will help not only contemporary artists, but also will be a boon for our cultural heritage. And there'll be a lot of space for all different types of stories to be told. And we're really excited about it. And we're hoping that we're, to push that forward as, as best we can. And I look forward to, I mean, we're not kidding that this is just the beginning. I look forward to one day, decades in the future, being able to say three strangers walked into the cliff house and um, <laughs> came out with a, um, a new way forward for history and art working together in a much uh, more symbiotic way on the West side. Um, mm -hmm. And 
with that, I will say, wow, thanks for hanging in there, everybody. Um, and thank you for your, for your feedback and for your questions. Um, um, you know, I'm here to answer all your Sutra Monkey needs uh, as far mm -hmm. as I can. Somebody um, corrected us and said that they are called gibbons. Oh boy. Yeah, I go. don't- Thank you because I use monkey as a catch all, if you will, and Gabriel. <laughs> corrected us um <laughs> thank you and and said that it was a a little gibbon thank you yeah i don't know my monkey uh I don't either. My, i'm sorry my gibbon i don't know my primary. i just know that they scream a holy living bejesus worth <laughs> of screams uh at the zoo and that those poor people that live into the you know move into those apartments on slope their first night in the apartment are gonna know all about that well now we're on a primate tangent but um <laughs> but uh just just so you just so you're aware, um, we've mentioned it before, but this is an ongoing project. Um, two years to save Sutro the portrait. Uh, that's just one of many. So we do appreciate you supporting oh, us as we as we move this uh, train along. Yeah. And um, you can do that by donating through our website, save the cliff house art. Is that right? Dot com. Save Cliff House Art. Cliff House Collection. <laughs> com. Oh my God, you guys. My brain. Or yeah. becoming a member of Western Neighborhoods Project, which we make that very easy. You can do that in any uh, on any page on either of our websites, and it gives you it supports this project. It also gets you a lot of cool things like members only access to walking tours and live podcast recordings, and you get that membership magazine. So, um, and feel free to reach out to John and I if anybody has any questions. Reach out to Great Highway Gallery or Act Art Conservation. We're Yep. absolutely please don't feel afraid to reach out to us we love talking about this stuff so we love talking in general which you know because you've been here for a, an over an hour and a half i think um so on that note i'm going to stop recording so that everything else will be off the record and you can really let us have it um <laughs> hold on <laughs>